name is Heather Segal, and as Andrea said, I've just moved from the University of Geneva to now the University of Warwick. And I want to give a big shout out here to um, a, all of the local organizing committee that really helped us transform this in-person meeting to an online one, as well as special shout outs to Elise, Ellen, and Dawn for the host hosting this and really doing a fantastic job. Without them, we wouldn't have this great platform, as well as a shout out to my fellow co-chair, Chad Bender, and the rest of the SOC who helped us all put together this really great platform and all of the great science that we're going to be discussing over the week. The rest of the SOC has tasked me to talk to you today about the various sources of stellar variability and the physics that drive them that might be that you might find in your exoplanet data. So in case you missed the first few days or maybe you haven't had your coffee yet, um, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So if we're looking for planets with the radial velocity method, then we're looking for planets that are gravitationally bound to one another. And so that means that they share a common center of mass and that causes the planet, then when it orbits, it causes the sun to then, the sun or the star to sort of wobble about that center of mass. And it, as it wobbles away from us, we'll see the light being shifted towards the redder end of the spectrum. And as it wobbles towards us, we'll see it shifted towards the bluer end of the spectrum. And the reason why we measure the starlight in particular and infer the presence of the planet is because the star completely outshines the planet. So almost everything we know about planets outside of our solar system comes from the stars themselves, the host stars. So you'll see this sort of famous plot here on the right hand side of 51 peg B that you will have seen probably several times throughout this, this workshop so far and probably again um, later on today and maybe even tomorrow and so on. So on the y-axis, you have your velocity of plus and minus 100 meters per second. And on the x-axis, you have your orbital phase. So this is what the sort of Doppler wobble looks like for your original sort of hot Jupiter exoplanet. For more on how to derive those radial velocities, what's in them, how we measure them to begin with, and how you figure fit your planets and, and learn about the statistics, I direct you to these talks here. Those are, will really help you look through and, and find out the fundamentals there. But let's dive into this 51 peg example. So look again at that y-axis, that plus and minus 100 meters per second. Now we're going to zoom in on this purple region here, and I'm going to overplot in red what an Earth twin would look like in terms of the Doppler wobble. It is a mere nine centimeters per second. It's incredibly tiny, and you can see that that would really be hidden in the uncertainties of those first exoplanet measurements. But now we've done a great job of improving our instrumental precision and our observing strategies. And you can see, for an example, from the Harps North Solar Telescope, what the uncertainties look like, how the air bars on that yellow data has shrunk significantly. And with the future generation of spectrographs like Express, Espresso, Newid, they're continuing to shrink. But even with the uncertainties that we have now, we can see that there's a whole host of variability in the RVs that completely swamps what would be that Earth twin signal. And the origin for that is the stars themselves in this case. I'm showing you an example from the sun where you can see that it's not a static homogeneous sphere. There are actually these inhomogeneities, these sort of blemishes, if you will, on the surface of the star. And for more on the sun, I would direct you to the talk by Annalise Matier after this, and she'll really dive into this solar data for you. Let's break down what's on the surface of the sun a little bit more. This is a nice example from Till Melbourne, where we're dividing it up by magnetic field and continuum intensity of brightness. So most of the star is this sort of quiet sun, where you, we, talk, we say quiet because we need magnetically quiet. There's not a lot of magnetic field. That's what you see in blue here. And then weaving in between that is this magnetic network, so higher magnetic field there. And then if you go a bit more magnetic field, you'll get to these plage regions and yellow here. And then a bit more on top of that, then you can find these spots, which is the highlighted there in orange. And, we'll, and I'll walk you through the physics for, for each of those. So this quiet sun or, or quiet uh, photosphere, a, as you will, what does that look like? So here's an observations from the DK Solar Telescope. So if your bandwidth is a little bit low here, I would really encourage you to go ahead and, and look, look these up on Google because they're incredible movies. 
So we have on the field of view about 30 by 30 megameters. So at the surface of our sun and sun-like stars, you have a convective envelope. So the heat transfer is convection. You have these hot bubbles of gas rising to the surface, being blue shifted because they're coming towards us, cooling and then falling back down to the surface being red shifted. And so you can see how this could impact our radial velocities. The net effect is several tens of centimeters per second, even though individual granules can move at a few kilometers per second. And that's because there's a lot of up and down flow averaging. For our sun, there's about 10 to the six granules overall. So a lot of the average is out. But you will also notice that these hot bubbles of gas, they are larger and they're brighter. So the blue shifts dominate overall. So there's this net convective blue shift. And how does this all impact our velocities? Well, if you remember from Sharon's talk, you have your stellar spectrum as an example, and you can cross correlate with your mask, and that gives you a cross correlation function on the right here. So any asymmetries in your line profiles then can translate towards asymmetries in your cross correlation function. And if you go to measure the centroid of that line profile or cross correlation function, and the asymmetries are changing, you might end up detecting a spurious velocity shift. So thinking you have a center of mass motion, but really it's just your line shape change. So diving a bit more into this, let's take um, an example of a line profile where we had a disk integration here. We integrated and we observed the sun or something like that. We have this gray profile here. Looks pretty symmetric, but let's um, dive a little bit deeper and let's say, okay, we can think of it roughly as a contribution from the granules and the intergranular lanes. That's quite simplistic, but you can see that these, these sort of um, different contributions, this is what their line profiles would look like, and we add them together in the right proportion to get this one. So one way to examine the symmetry of this line is to look at the bisector. So we take horizontal slices and we grab the midpoints. If you had a perfectly symmetric line, this would be straight. And at first glance, this looks straight. But if we zoom in, we get this characteristic C shape where these granules here, this granular line profile is contributing to our net blue shift and this sort of um, trend here towards the, the bluer end here. And then the intergranular lane component is kind of depressing this red red ring. So the takeaway is that convection introduces asymmetries, a net blue shift and temporal velocity shifts. Individual granules on the sun and sun-like stars have a lifetime of five minutes. And for hotter stars, it's maybe more like 10 minutes. But still, you might think we can just average over this. However, it's not so simple. In the bottom right-hand side, I'm showing you a single exposure from the sun. And then all the rest are one hour time averages. And you can see even after averaging for an hour, there's a lot of structure there, partially because the granules tend to appear and disappear in the same location. And that makes the noise even more correlated here. And you kind of get the hint here because these things here are, are manifestations of magnetic field. They weave in between those granules and sort of hold them in place. And so averaging them out is not going to be the, the most ideal way of dealing with that variability. So of course now, every time we say convection or magnetic, what we really mean is magnetoconvection. So when we talk about granulation, we mean magnetoconvection. So I'm showing you some simulations here, but they do a good example of showing you how the continuum intensity on the left maps to the magnetic field on the right. And you can get kilogauss fields weaving in between these granules. The top shows you what you would see at disk center, that sort of bird's eye view. And then at the bottom, that shows you when you're looking towards the limb. And so you can think of the granulation as sort of these hills and valleys. And as you go towards the limb, you begin to be able to see some of the valley walls and no longer see the tops of the, of the, of the hills and the bottoms of the valleys. So there's center to limb effects as well. But if you wanna know more about how the magnetic fields are generated and driven, check out some of the stellar dynamo um, research that I highlight here. So the takeaways, um, I mentioned, but one thing I didn't mention is that the net RV effect decreases for cooler stars and increases for more evolved stars. And that has to do with the, the contrast of the granules to intergranular lanes and the lifetimes as well. But the key takeaway is that the convection and magnetic field it, um, have an interplay and sort of drive everything here. These collections of individual granules 
um, can form super granules with a diameter of about 30 megameters. And the thing to keep in mind here is that you have that sort of network that I talked about earlier, and that's sort of what holds these collections of granules together. And you get horizontal flows here. And that's what you're seeing in this Doppler gram from SOHO, where you have the blue and the red shifts here. The contrasts are not very large for super granules, so it's not um, a very dominant effect. And the horizontal flows are, are the larger part of the super granular cells, and they're about 300 meters per second. But remember, anything that's perpendicular to our line of sight doesn't contribute to our, our velocities. So because the dominant thing is horizontal at the center, it doesn't have a huge effect. So the net effect is a couple meter per second level here. And the net effect for the granulation was several tens of centimeters per second. So just to kind of put them into perspective. So the super granular lifetime for our sun is about two days but we really don't know a lot about supergranulation. We don't really still know how it um, manifests to begin with, like what exactly is the, the driving mechanism there. And it's only really been explored on the sun. So there's a lot to do to drive this towards the stellar side of things. So looking at uh, what else did the convection do? Well, the, the hot bubbles of gas, those granules, their motion excites pressure mode oscillations. These are these P modes you may have heard about. Uh, mentioned it in the first couple of days here. Essentially, the, the motion of the convection, convection is actually driving acoustic modes. And it's kind of like our star or our sun or whatever is ringing at a particular frequency, like you would ring a bell. And because the surface is moving towards us and away from us, we have line of sight of velocity shifts there as well, those Doppler shifts. To, to give you an idea of the scale here, I'm showing you some bison data. On the y-axis, you have velocity and plus and minus five meters per second. And on the x-axis, you have time in minutes, up to 300 minutes. And you'll notice by eye straight away that in terms of radial velocities here for the sun, the oscillations are really dominating over the granulation. You can pick out how it's oscillating there. And you might even notice that it's at this sort of characteristic five minutes. That's, um, that's what we would call the sort of solar P modes for, for the sun. Looking at this in terms of the power density on the y-axis and the frequency on the x-axis here, you can see that the granulation and supergranulation really covers a large range in frequency space. And so that also hints at the fact that it's not going to be easy to average out, whereas the oscillations cover a much more finite range in frequency, which makes them more amenable to sort of bin them out or fine tune your observations or even just to be able to, to model them. So again, because the pressure modes are connected so intimately to the convection, they also decrease for cooler stars and increase for um, hotter stars and more evolved stars. So now let's think about, let's go back to the convection and say, what happens if we have a chunk of magnetic field? We really have this concentration of magnetic field. Well, it kind of acts to take a bite out of the convection in the sense that it really suppresses the motion of those granules. And if you have enough of the magnetic field, it's going to suppress its, the heat transport so much that you actually get a colder patch there. And that's why you can get dark star spots or sunspots. An example of a, of a real sunspot is shown in this movie here, where you can see there's a lot of velocity flows going on that I would encourage you to, to check out on your own time. So now what happens if you get to the case where you have more magnetic field than say that the network or the or the quiet sun, but not so much as a spot. Well, what can happen is you can have enough magnetic field to evacuate your flux tubes and alter your opacity, which then means you can actually see deeper into the star and deeper into the star is hotter. So in particular at the limbs, what you are seeing then in these more magnetic regions here is you're seeing these hot granular walls. And that those show up here as these sort of brighter regions that you can see in this image from SDO here. So you have your dark sunspots here, and then you have your bright, hotter um, faculator plage. And it's important to keep in mind here that the, the terms faculae and plage are often used sort of interchangeably. It's sometimes faculae refer to the sort of smaller, more like snake-like features here. Um, and sometimes people refer to faculae as the whole thing. Um, or they may refer to faculae as the smaller ones and plage as the bigger patches but sometimes people also 
simply refer to plasma as the chromosphere counterpart to faculae. Remembering now that the photosphere is the surface of our, our, of our star or the sun and the chromosphere is one level up from that. So how does this contribute to the velocity variations? We have two competing effects. For one, you have the fact that you have brightness in homogeneities. So there's a photometric effect. So take it, for example, in this schematic, you have our, our star that's rotating about its spin axis as normal, the blue being blue shifted towards us and the red being red shifted. And in the center of this schematic, you'll see the sort of um, the mock line profile. We have flux on the y-axis and velocity on the x-axis. And you can see that where there's a dark region, you end up getting an emission bump in the line profile. And that's because you have less light to be absorbed there. So there's an asymmetry that's introduced here. And if you were to go ahead and measure the, try and measure the centroid of this line, you are most likely going to measure a spurious velocity shift. So it might look like you have a Doppler wobble, but really what you have is just an asymmetry here. And this is going to be tied to the stellar rotation. So you often see this modulated by the stellar rotation period. Now, in addition, we have the fact that the convection is suppressed. And so that means we have less of that net convective blue shift. So you get a wholesale kind of um, red shift in there as well. So you have two things here. You have the convective blue shift being suppressed and you have additional asymmetries on top of that from the photometric effect. So the takeaways here are that the faculae are those sort of bright regions of magnetic um, activity at this center, they manifest as magnetic bright points and towards the limb you're seeing those faculae look are really just the hot granular walls. The spots are the dark, um, cooler regions and there's a lot of velocity flows associated with those to check out. But really the key thing is that they both alter the brightness and suppress the convection. And the spots live for a similar um, lifetime to the rotation period, which is about 27 days for the sun. But the plage can survive for several rotations beyond that. Also important to point out is that the sort of active region to quiet star contrast decreases as we go towards cooler stars or towards redder wavelengths. So it's one sort of mitigation um, strategy is, is to kind of target there. Of course, keeping in mind that you're, it's important to, to look at what dynamo is operating and what sort of um, other physics are at play because you can have um, cooler stars that are still very active and have a lot of radial velocity vari variability. The net effect that we're talking here is on the meter per second scale, a few meter per second, but it can be much larger if you have spot dominated young stars. And there's been a number of times where we, in the past, someone had thought they found a hot Jupiter, but in fact, it was actually just star spots. The dominant effect for the sun-like stars is the suppression of convective blue shift um, in those sufficiently large magnetic regions. Of course, all of this is tied to the magnetic activity, right? So it's going to be modulated over the magnetic activity cycle. I'm showing you a plot here from the Desch Meunier where she has shown you um, what the radial velocity variation of the sun should be doing over a solar cycle. So on the y-axis, you have the scale of up to 12 meters per second. And on the x-axis, you have days. So it's a solar cycle, so about 11 years. And you can see there's quite a lot of variability going on here. A lot of the variability going on in the shorter time scales is that rotationally modulated stuff. But this big trend over the whole activity cycle is largely driven by the change in the suppression of the convective blue shift as your sort of average magnetic field changes. Putting this back into context again, let's remind ourselves, what does that nine centimeter per second signal look like? It's really tiny here. So it's almost like trying to like find a needle in a cosmic haystack here. Uh, we really need to know a lot about the star to be able to disentangle these two. So there are a variety of different things that I haven't discussed with you today. Things like flares or meridional flows, those active region flows that I mentioned, as well as R modes and, and so on. Um, the key takeaway here though is the more that we improve our instruments, the higher precision we get, the more accurately or more precisely we can measure our radio velocities, the better resolution we have, the better signal to noise we have, the, the more stellar physics we're going to need to take into account, especially when looking for those low amplitude Doppler wobbles.
So there's probably, once we've solved the bigger issues, a whole host of smaller scale issues we'll need to look at. And for some of these, I've highlighted some uh, references here in the bottom right to take a look at. So there are loads of great talks all week. The ones that are most relevant to the talk here are, um, I've highlighted, but really want to ask you to stick around for the talk by Annalise Mertier, where she's going to talk to you about that solar data I presented and really show you the guts of it and what's in it and what we can learn from it. And then Jen Burt is going to um, follow up later to talk about techniques to mitigate stellar variability, because that's not something I really um, touched on here today as well as um, Scott Gowdy is gonna talk about um, the EPRV initiative. So this is a NASA NSF led initiative, but really it's led to worldwide collaboration where we're trying to find um, a roadmap to, to really get to the highest precision radio velocity possible to confirm and characterize a habitable planets. So it, it's not just learning about the stars, also learning about the instrument and the telerics and so on. To highlight from that initiative and to sort of summarize the talk, here's the various sort of physical effects that I've mentioned here today and color coded by where we should be investing our next steps, where we should be investing our time and resources in terms of improving our knowledge, in particular understanding how we can use the sun, which is our best studied star and connect it to, to um, other types of stars and, and getting the really the fundamentals like things about the line formation and the behavior of the stellar lines and so on, as well as those faculae of plasma effect, um, because that seems to be the dominant effect that we need to understand for, for sun-like stars. So the, the takeaway here is that the interplay between convection and magnetic fields drives most, if not all stellar surface variability. And as you can see from the solar data plotted in gray uh, relative to an Earth analog there in purple, it really swamps the Doppler wobble from low mass long period planets. So it is absolutely critical that we understand the host stars if we want to unveil rocky temperate worlds in the future. And um, I think I finished early here, so we've got a bit of time to, to dig into some questions if you have any. Great, thanks a lot, Heather. Um, yes, we have a bunch of questions. So there are a few questions um, related to the quest, um, lifetime of um, granulation. Um, what sets the lifetime? What is the physical mechanism that um, explains that uh, if you even stack several images or a few hours, there may be correlations? And which role do magnetic fields play in those? Yeah, so um, that, that's um, quite complex. So um, I'll just try to give you kind of a generic um, idea about things. So it's really like the, the mass and the effective temperature and the surface gravity. Those are the, basically the main things that are going to set um, the properties for your convective envelope. And that will kind of drive um, what your heat transport looks like and how big your granules are and how fast they can move. Um, and so for hotter stars, you're going to have faster moving granules and you are going to have um, bigger contrast between the granules and intergranular lanes. And so that's gonna give rise to even um, more intense uh, oscillations as well because you have faster moving convection. So you can kind of see how they're um, tied to there. And just like another question you had tied in there, how does it relate to the magnetic field? Was, was yeah, which role does do magnetic fields play in this? Yeah, so the, the magnetic fields are, are everywhere. So for we, you can kind of think of it as the fact that we have like a, you can like a seed magnetic field that happens from when the star is, is formed. And then you have some sort of dynamo mechanism that continues to drive that magnetic field generation. And in some of those plots, you could see that in between these individual granules is where you have the magnetic field um, sort of weaving in between there. And it acts to kind of constrict the motions of the granules. So when you have more magnetic field, you suppress the, the granules, which suppresses the pressure mode oscillations and gives rise to these uh, more intense inhomogeneities like the spots that you see here, um, as well as, as the plage, which are sort of shown a little bit here in this artist impression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then there are a couple of questions related to um, or related to each other. 
that um, ask about um, how much of that uh, do we know from measurements? How much of that is actually due to modeling? And um, how does that change if we go to other spectral types, say to M dwarfs? Yeah, so I mean, the, the best studied star we have is our sun. Um, so I would go ahead and um, point you towards Annalise's talk to, to share about how, how much stuff you can learn from, from the sun. Um, we, we know quite a bit empirically, especially about the convection and, um, and the oscillations, especially for the sun. And for the oscillations, we have these sort of scaling relations that allow us to, to look at um, different spectral types. And we can look at the oscillations in both the radio velocities and the photometry. And so the, the Kepler satellite did wonders for, the, for studying the oscillations by using a sort of really precise space-based photometry. And, and TESS will do a great job as, as well as Plato in the future. So there, there is a lot of empirical stuff driving that. In terms of our understanding for things like faculae and spots, I would say that still our best understanding comes from the sun. Um, we, yeah, we have the big advantage that we can spatially resolve these things and measure local properties. Yes, exactly. And it, it becomes much more difficult to spatially resolve other stars. If you have an evolved star, you might be able to spatially resolve that. Or if you have a, a star that is really rapidly rotating, you might be able to resolve some of the, the impact of, of the spots using like Doppler tomography or something. Um, but most of the time we have to sort of infer the properties and, and relate them back to the stellar activity indicators that I think Annalise and, and Jen will, will um, talk to you about. But um, I would say uh, uh, I'm a bit biased because my background is, is working very closely with um, solar and stellar physicists who use 3D magnetohydrodynamic simulations. And there's really quite a lot of information there where you can go straight from the MHD equations and kind of do from the ground up and simulate uh, what we should be looking at and we can tweak the magnetic field. So we can take it from both avenues here. But of course, every time you have simulations, you're going to want to empirically um, validate those as well. And one other sort of nice thing that you can see from the um, sort of artist impression that I had showed of the transiting planet is you can use transiting planets to spatially resolve your stars as well. So we can sometimes kind of do the inverse. We need to know the star to know the planet, but we can also use the planet sometimes to, to probe the star. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then there was a question um how um, all of this changes when you go to M dwarfs. And another yeah. question um, also about the activity cycles. What do we know about cycles in other stars and how that depends on the stellar type? Yeah, so as we go to, towards cooler stars, um, the, we see that the convection is less intense in, in some way that you want to think about it. The flow velocities are slower the contrast between the granules and intergranular lanes is less. The contrast between temperature variations is less. So between even a dark spot and the sort of um, quiet photosphere around it, that contrast is less. So to some extent, everything is less when you go cooler. But if you go too cool, sometimes you will get M dwarfs that have really large um, spot variabilities. So if you go towards the hotter stars, you're going to get more intense convection and more intense sort of spot contrast and everything. So you might think of maybe a K dwarf as like a nice in between because it's sometimes less active than those M dwarfs that might have a different dynamo mechanism operating in them, um, but um, also less active than the G dwarf in terms of the, the granulation and, and those properties. So if you're trying to find an Earth sort of our habitable planet. The other thing to keep in mind is when you go towards cooler things, then that brings that habitable zone in closer. So it's kind of a double whammy. If you go towards those K or M stars, the Doppler wobble of a temperate planet is going to be larger, but the convection and oscillation stuff, that noise is going to be less. And you don't even really care about the, the oscillation or the convections, and you only really care about the larger amplitude stuff like the spots or the other faculae. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, finally, um, could you say a little bit about activity cycles in other stars? What do we yeah. know about that? Yeah, so it's, it's still quite um, an ongoing research area. 
So we have detected magnetic activity cycles in other stars. And actually in the hands-on session today, Nathan will show you um, one way to do that. And it's kind of looking at these activity indicators. So one of those is this, the emission in the calcium H and K. And you can look at that and, and see how that varies over, uh, over time. And you know if these activity indicators are varying that it's a, it kind of tells you possibly you might be seeing some sort of magnetic activity cycle. So we, we do know they exist. They can be as short as a couple of years or they can be like the sun as well, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done to, to look at magnetic activity cycles and other stars. But if you're looking for an earth analog, you wanna care about those because the time scales that you need to observe just to build up enough data is, is on those potential activity cycles.